This is Women's Leadership Success, episode number 108. Do you ever feel like you've gotten stuck in your career? Are you discouraged that opportunities are passing you by? Do you ever wonder how successful women reinvent themselves? Or maybe you would like to position yourself as an expert and thought leader in your field and be forever employable. If you are ready to step into a life where new opportunities come to you, join me and my guest for the step-by-step formula to reinventing yourself. Welcome to Women's Leadership Podcast, showing you how to influence people, improve your performance, and advance your career. Brought to you by women's leadership and career expert Sabrina Brom and womensleadershipsuccess.com. Here's your chance to meet women trendsetters leading the way to success, accomplishment, and balance in business and life. No matter if you're a manager, CEO, or entrepreneur, join Sabrina for coaching and no-nonsense advice to improve your career and bottom line. Hello, this is Sabrina Brom with womensleadershipsuccess.com radio, and I'm really thrilled today to have Jeff Gotthelf with us and a I'm so excited to talk to you about your book, Forever Employable, How to Stop Looking for Work and Let the Next Job Find You. But before I do that, would you tell us some of your background? What, what are you an expert in? Sure. Uh, thanks, Sabrina. And, and uh, it's a pleasure to speak with you as well. My background is in design, actually. I spent the first half of my career being a web designer, various um, you know, in, in the early days of the web and, and designing websites initially and then applications and services and systems and so forth. In kind of the second half of my career, I took that design expertise and moved it more into product management and then ultimately really delving into organizational design, culture, digital transformation, business agility. And the short of it is I, I, I help companies build great products, but then I also help the leaders of those organizations build the cultures that build great products. And I know you're uh, modest, so I'll say that you're one of the top experts in this field in the world. So I'm, I'm really excited to have you on the show today. Um, and, but this, this book is really different than what you normally do. And I wonder, what, was your, what, what led you to do this? What were you wanting to do by writing a book to help other people really do well in their careers. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I, I didn't see myself heading down this particular path, but in the, so, so I spent the last eight years really building up my own practice, my own business, my own content platform and audience and network and so forth. And over the last two, three, four, five years, almost on a weekly basis, I get some kind of inbound request. Hey, Jeff, how did you get that book deal? Hey, Jeff, how did you get on that speaking at that conference on that stage. Um, how, how did you, you know, how did you do this? How did you do that? And to me, that's a signal from the market. In fact, the, um, the first book I wrote was called Sense, uh, second, sorry, second book I wrote was called Sense and Respond. And I was sensing stuff from the market here, inbound requests from people who were paying attention to me that said, we'd like this information from you. And I let it sit for a while because this is not typically what I talk about. And this is not typically the kind of uh, expert advice that I give. And frankly, this was going to get personal, which is also something I didn't do before. I didn't, I I wrote a a technical design book. I wrote a business book Mm -hmm. or another technical book, right? And so this was, this was going to be personal. And so I let it sit for a while. And, um, and so finally it, 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 it was sitting there for so long and the inbound requests kept coming in. I figured it was, it was time to actually get this thing off the ground and really start doing something about this and, and seeing, where it, seeing where it ends up. And who do you hope that it helps? What kind of people do you want to get something out of this book? So the target reader persona was a mid-career knowledge worker. That's uh-huh. who I was writing it for. And it, in my head, it was my best friend, to be perfectly transparent. Um, it, it was, he's, he's the same age as me, he's 47, same age as me, he's working professionally, same amount of time as me, about you know, 20, 22 years, 
or so, a little bit longer. Um, and I see he, he's got he's got everything it takes to to build this kind of career safety net around himself based on his reputation but he doesn't take the actions to do it, right? He's smart. He's got the experience. He's good in front of a crowd. He's friendly, social. He can write, he can speak. Um, and yet it seems like an overwhelming task for him and, and then he doesn't do it. And then what I see in him and the, the net result of that is that every single time that there's a merger, an acquisition, a layoff, a pandemic, uh, whatever, a shift in the marketplace, right? He panics, and he rushes towards his resume and he starts updating it. And he's like, oh, crap, now I got to go job hunt again. And he's got three kids, you know, like he's, and he's genuinely concerned and, and rightfully so. And, you know, he's watched me. I've known him for 30 years, right? He's watched me do this on a day in and day out basis. And I wanted to write this for people like him, people who are 10, 15 years or more into their career who feel that panic every time that there's a shift in their organization or in the marketplace and to really help them alleviate that, alleviate that, that, that stress and that anxiety, because if you can make this a successful way of working, then you start to generate a continuous stream of inbound opportunities towards you so that if a pandemic hits or a layoff or a merger and acquisition, well, you're okay because you've got some other options that are always sort of a, a, an email away. That. That is so cool. And, um, you know, I, I read a lot of books. I attend a lot of seminars. This is the clearest step-by-step book on how to do that that I've come across. Um, and we'll get more into that, but I'd like to know the backstory. What, so what, what was the, the pain that made you know you needed to change? What happened? So I, um, it was interesting because it was unexpected. So I turned 35 on January 31st, 2008, and everything was great at 35. Um, <laughs> married, two little girls, a uh, house in New Jersey, suburbs outside New York City, a couple of cars, commuting to, I had a nice, I was the director of design at a high growth startup. Um, you know, I had a decent salary. Everything was good. And yet I wake up, I wake up in the morning on my 35th birthday and I'm having, I'm in a cold sweat. I've got this panic attack going on and I, I can't, I can't really understand why, because like I told you, everything's good. And it dawns on me a little while later that why I was having this panic attack. And, and the realization was for me is that I had done everything I was supposed to do up until that point. Everything, they, everything we're taught to do, everything my parents said was the right steps, right? You, you, you apply for an entry-level position, and then you work for, you gain some experience, and then you make a, a move and you gain a little bit more expert, a little bit more responsibility, a little bit more money. Maybe somebody starts reporting to you at some point. And you kind of make these, these, these little hops. And I did that for, for a decade, and I got to middle management. And the realization I made was that for me, that was going to become unsustainable that my, my biggest fear was that in five years, five years from when I turned 35, I would be 40. And look, to be fair, from, from that side of 40, 40 looks, feels old, right? From, yeah. <laughs> from, 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 right. From this side of 40, 40 is great. Like, it's awesome. Um, <laughs> right, thr- right. Thrill, thrilled for 40. But nevertheless, like, you can feel like you're going to kind of hit this big milestone. Everybody's like, 40 years old, my God. Um, I was going to be too expensive and I was going to be unemployable because what I was seeing was as I was becoming more of a manager and less of a practitioner, my design skills were atrophying. And I'm hiring all these designers onto my team and they're better than me and they're faster than me and they're hungrier than me. And most importantly, they're cheaper than me. Oh. And, and so, so I'm terrified. I'm terrified that, in, and look, and especially in, in, any, in any position, as you start to climb the corporate ladder, it's by design, there are less of these senior roles, right? There's going to be fewer managers than there are individual contributors. This was particularly true for design jobs. After, after you know, director of design, maybe there's a chief design officer, chief experience officer role, but not that many. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I was terrified, frankly, that I wouldn't be able to provide for my family in five years. That was the, the catalyst for change at that moment. Because the way I saw it is if I kept playing the game the way that I'd been doing up until that point, which is the way that most people play it, 
right? I was going to start losing more and more and more. And, and, and that was terrifying. That's, that's, that makes a lot of sense. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't have that epiphany at 35. They realize it at 45 or 55. Mm. But it's, it's, such, it's so important. And I'm thinking of people that I know, men and women that are at the top of their game in terms of their expertise who are 50 to 65 saying, well, now I can't, how can I get another job? Because I'm too old, which is ridiculous, of course, but also true sometimes. And so this is super helpful for what to do if you're in that position or if you're so smart that you're in your 30s and you're listening to this podcast that you can start right now and start doing them. One of the things I really like that you said in the book, you said how to always be ready for the next step in your career and development. And what one of the things that I was thinking about was, okay, well, most of my audience work, work in corporations, a lot of C-level or management people. But there are people that want to go out on their own and it doesn't really have to be either or. or. The, this, what you're saying is a good plan for if you work in a company or if you're starting out on your own and you want to know what steps to take, right? Absolutely, right? So this, this, the, the material that I talk about in the book, it, it's based around my story. But there are other stories that illustrate it as well. And, and my story goes from full-time in-house employment to ultimately self-employment. But these same tactics can be used for you to, to, to position yourself in-house for greater, uh, greater roles, greater responsibilities, ongoing success forever employability, if, you, if you'll indulge me a little bit, right? Um, and, and if it's not within the corporation that you're currently in, well, that halo begins to extend externally, and then you start to attract other opportunities from outside as well. So you're always creating that type of, of opportunity. The and, interesting and, thing, go ahead. Yeah, I, I'm just going to say, and you're also growing your confidence as you do this, because you're, I, I, you're just absolutely. getting better and better at what you're doing. I'm sorry, what were you going to say? Well, so, so the interesting thing is, is especially if you're, if you're a senior executive um, in, in an organization, there, some organizations are not going to feel too great about this. They're, they're going to be a little concerned. In fact, um, there was a point in time recently where uh, I, was, I was doing a little customer discovery work, some interviews, um, because I was thinking about building a, um, an educational retreat for executives kind of product. I live in Barcelona, and so I was going to have people come here and do a three-day sort of type of thing. And, and, I, and it was going to be for, for senior executives. And so I started interviewing some of them to understand uh, what it is that would get them to come here, what would keep them from coming here, do something like that. One of the overwhelming themes that came from that was that any kind, at the executive level, any kind of interaction that was perceived as a conference, a public event, a conference, a, a mingling with others outside of the corporation was, was perceived as job hunting. I'm job hunting and I, I don't want my bosses to know that I'm job hunting. Uh -huh. and, and so what's interesting about this is at the corporate level is if you start to do this and you start to kind of expand, so you can do it internally, right? You can do it internally and build your confidence internally. The, the internal conferences, the corporate blog, the corporate podcast, trainings, that type of thing. As you start to kind of build this outside of the walls of your organization, um, some organizations don't look on this too kindly. Right. It becomes a really interesting balancing act because obviously you'd like, I mean, you might want to expand your personal brand beyond your organization and they might not be thrilled about that. Right. Uh, the way I've seen people be successful with that is being very strategic and representing their company at a conference. Yes. Uh, being a spokesperson and that's a way to show your expertise and, and still get some, um, some buzz about you. Did you know you can change your leadership trajectory just by understanding your talents and what areas you need to improve? Would you like an easy way to find out where you are in your leadership and career development? Well, here's how you can. I've designed a simple four-minute career and leadership quiz that will help you. And as one of my listeners, you can get it for free. Just go to careerdevelopmentquiz.com 
And once you are there, complete the confidential quiz. You'll get your score and suggestions immediately. Plus, you may even qualify for a free coaching session. So just go to careerdevelopmentquiz.com and fill out the quiz. So how do you start? What are if I'm if I'm a, a you know a, a manager or director and I want to start doing this, how do I start? Well, so the first thing you really have to decide is where to plant your flag, and that's really the first step in the process that I talk about in the book. Planting your flag is deciding what you're going to base your platform on. Right. So the whole the whole goal here is to build a platform of expertise and experience and thought leadership that then drives, you builds audience, builds network, and then starts to drive opportunities towards you. So the first step is deciding, well, what are you going to base that platform on? And for many folks, this is the biggest obstacle because and it's been fat, and this, this is one of those assumptions. I talk a lot about assumptions in my work about how we make assumptions about how the world is, and then you actually go talk to people or see what happens. You're like, wow, that's totally different than what I thought. My my assumption was that everybody's got a passion and uh, an expertise, experience. When I say plant your flag, like an idea should come out right away. It turns out this is by far one of the biggest obstacles to getting this process started. Is I think the majority of people, generally speaking, out there wouldn't know where to plant their flag, like what, where, where to start with this, because they don't see their story, their experience, their expertise as unique or as something worth sharing. Now, they may have done interesting things and they may have achieved a lot in their lives, but they don't see it as, as anything to talk about or anything to stand out, mm-hmm. anything that stands out in, in a digital, in, a, in an internet enabled world where there's a lot of noise, Right. And so to help people overcome that, there's a couple of tools that I use. Now, number one is, is a little motivational speech. And the motivational speech is this. Um, the unique value proposition that you have is your story. Nobody else has your story. No one has taken the steps that you've taken. No one has overcome the challenges you've, you've overcome in, those, in that order. No one has achieved the things that you have in the way that you've done them. So you have a unique story that no one else can tell. Number one. Mm -hmm. So that is the first thing. And it's worth telling because others are trying things similar to you and they want to know how you did it and they want to learn from you. That's, that's a hundred percent true. Um, second thing to remember, there's always room for entry level content for one-on-one level content. I think especially as we get become more senior in an organization and then we get more experience underneath our belts, there's this feeling like, well, we have to convey wisdom, like the decades of wisdom that we have. And certainly, please, please, if you have it, share it. But don't feel like everything you have to do has to be a PhD level uh, content on your your field of expertise. There's always room for entry level, 101 level basic content. There's always new people entering a profession or entering a particular track. And I think the last thing I wanted to share when it comes to figuring out where to, where to plant your flag, there's a tool that I discovered after writing the book that I, so I, I wrote some questions in the book that felt uh, that, that, that I thought were, were good, a good ways to figure out how to plant your flag. After the book came out, people started reaching out to me and they said, Jeff, this thing that you talk about in the book, it's really similar to this Japanese concept called Ikigai. It's I-K-I-G-A-I. And Ikigai is Japanese for your reason for being. And it, it, if you Google it, you'll find this really pretty chart of what it looks like. Basically, it comes down to four questions to help you identify where to plant your flag. First question, what do you love? Could be personal things, could be professional things, but what do you love? Okay. Second question, what are you good at? Right? Mm-hmm. Not the same thing as what do you love? You can love right. a lot of things, but not, not be good at. Right? Um, third question, what does the world need? Okay, so what are the trends? Where are people heading? What's happening in the world right now? And the final question, what can you be paid for? Now, the goal of this exercise is to answer those questions independently and then figure out which of the answers actually ticks all four boxes. And the thing or things that tick all four boxes can be the flag that you plant. Usually that's a good place to start. That is, that is just an incredible 
piece of information to share with our with the audience that's just so so good so and you also what you talk about what are you going to get paid for and that's basically you're solving a problem that people have right and um what 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 else what else um what are the can you talk a little bit about the five main ideas um to help them do this that you talk about in the book absolutely so so there's there are these qualities that in hindsight i discovered and uh and activated if you will in myself that i um that in many cases i didn't know i had and and most importantly um it's interesting to look for them because inevitably you find them and they're the things that really drive this uh this way of working. So the first one was entrepreneurialism. Uh, that was something that, you know, if you're going to build this, uh, this platform of expertise, you have to be entrepreneurial because essentially you're, you're, you're treating your career as a, as a product or a service, as a, as a business. So mm-hmm. Reed Hoffman had a book called The Startup of You. Like if that, if that's, that's a helpful sort of metaphor for this. Uh-huh. So you have to, you have to think entrepreneurially about your, 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 um, your career, right? What am I going to do? What actions, what proactive actions am I going to take to make sure that this business survives for the duration that I needed to survive and, and really looking for, if you're not an entrepreneur person, like for example, when I set out to do this, I actually, I didn't see my, I see myself today as entrepreneurial, but back then I didn't, I, I, you know, I definitely had that Silicon Valley, you know, mental model of what an entrepreneur is. And I'm, and I'm not that guy. I'm, I'm, I didn't see myself as an ideas guy. I saw myself as an execution guy, but I had done things in my life that were entrepreneurial. And I was, I was looking for those for inspiration. For example, I played in bands for a long time, for about a decade. I, I played in touring bands on the East coast of the United States. Bands are startups, hundred percent. Like they are a startup. You, it's you and your buddies. Uh, you have a crazy idea. You're going to change the world. You pour everything you have into it. You sleep on floors, you eat noodles, right? And your goal is to try to build a thriving community and, and business around this crazy idea of yours. And I did this for a long time and I helped run those bands. And so I had entrepreneurial experience, right? So look for those entrepreneurial experiences in your life. So that's one. Number two, self-confidence. Self-confidence is... Um, is, is a lot of people struggle with this one, I think, um, and really looking for opportunities in your life that have forced you to kind of lean into things to, to, to build the kind of confidence that helped you succeed to where you are today, because clearly the, the people listening to this podcast are successful individuals, right? Again, for me, being on stage in front of sometimes, you know, honestly, being on stage in front of 5,000 people is far, far less daunting than being on stage in front of five people. So it's like, I was just saying being on stage in front of five people and still having to put forward that show that we did was great. But really the story that I love to tell about where I really kind of picked up a good chunk of the self-confidence that I feel like I have today is I spent six months in the circus. I, uh, I toured with the Clyde Beatty Cole Brothers Circus uh, in, in the summer of 1995. I spent six months on the road um, traveling, uh, with a circus. So I ran away with it. Like literally that's what I did. And it, it was, it's a completely strange place. Like it, it far, it's a foreign culture. It's 200 people who live together in this very closed community that travels on the fringes of what you would call normal society. And you're thrust into it. I was thrust into it. So I was an outsider and I had, I had to survive and be successful. And I spent six months learning how to do that, building relationships, collaborating, failing a lot, um, embarrassing myself in front of 4,000 children who really wanted to see things happen in, in the circus, right? So anyway, I can tell stories about each one of them, but, but just to kind of get through it, right? So entrepreneurialism, self-confidence. The next thing is continuous learning. This is the thing where if, if you're thinking about your business or your, your business unit or your organization, if your organization stops learning, it stagnates and it dies. Same thing for your career. You've got to continuously learn where things are headed, how to better deliver uh, your, your core value. And that comes through reading and listening to podcasts and going to conferences and engaging. S- continuous improvement. 
is the fourth one. And that's taking those learnings and applying them. Okay, I learned something new. I'm going to make myself better. And there's a concept, there's a phrase here that I, that I love that I learned. I learned it from a TED Talk, the most cliche thing you can say, right, these days. But uh, it's a phrase called enthusiastic skepticism. And I learned it from a TED Talk by Astro Teller, who runs X, Google's Moonshot Factory. And what that means is that I'm enthusiastically skeptical that this is the best I can do. So I'm always looking for ways to get better and improve. And then the last one is reinvention. So we have entrepreneurialism, self-confidence, continuous learning, continuous improvement, and reinvention. And the reinvention is key, especially for folks 15, 20, 25 years into their career, because the core value that you deliver is going to be the same, in my opinion, throughout your career. But the way that you deliver it and the people that you deliver it to are going to need, you're going to need to reinvent yourself in new ways over time. It's just a really quick analogy. And because I know it's a really long answer to your question, but Mm -hmm. a really quick, a really quick story from my world. So one of the things that I do is I, I work with organizations and I teach them how to do design thinking and product thinking when it comes to their products and services. Mm -hmm. There are departments in the organization that would be um, very well served by these ideas that I never get to see. I never, I never meet. Mm -hmm. For example, human resources. I have essentially been slowly reinventing myself over the last 18 to 20 months, taking the core values, same exact things that I've been teaching for 20 years and transferring them into the world of human resources in an effort to reinvent myself as someone who can help those departments improve as well as the product and and development departments as well. So those are the five qualities that I've seen in myself, right? And all of this is fueling the content that I'm generating and sharing back with the world. That makes a lot of sense. And I I was thinking as you continuously learn and you, um, you apply it and reinvent yourself, you're also, you're, you're refining your material. You're refining your expertise. You're continually expanding what you know or how you can utilize it. It's, it's very exciting. Um, and, you know, I think if, if there's one thing, with those four things, if we could talk everybody that's listening to this show and that will read your book into just doing those four things, they probably will not have any trouble making a living. I, I, I agree a hundred percent. Yeah. It's, it's so, so great. The one kind of the elephant in the room that I find is how do you deal with failure? Because the reality is if you don't do anything, you're not going to fail. But if you get out there and you start giving talks or writing things or trying something new or like developing into human resources, how, do, how can we hold failure so that we can make the best use of it? Do you have a suggestion on that? There's two things that come to mind immediately. So number one, let's talk about uh, the scope of the failure, right? So the goal is to reduce the scope of the failure, right? Like, if, right. If, if, like for example, I would not recommend that you give the first talk of your life in front of 10,000 people. Good point. Just, good, right? Good point. <laughs> call, call me crazy, right? Like there's there there are opportunities for you to probably build up build up to that. So so how do you then how do you reduce the the scope of the failure? Like, well, can, as can you I, start, can I can I yeah. interrupt you right there because I help a lot of people prepare for presentations to the CEO or to a board or to a group, and I'm amazed at how many people go into super important meetings without doing it beforehand or rehearsing it beforehand. So yeah. go ahead. But No, it's, ama- it's amazing, right? I'm, I'm just going to wing it, right? Yeah, and and right. That famous last words, right? Right. Um, so then how do you reduce the risk of the failure, right? So for example, let's, let's, just, use, let's just go with this example because right? it's a good one, right? So then how do you reduce the risk of the failure? Well, one thing you can do is stand in front of the mirror in, in your house and give that talk five times. It feels stupid, but it works, and it get and you get better at it. Um, or you know what? Instead of getting in front of ten thousand people, give it in front of ten, and then get that feedback. So, so you want to reduce the risk of the failure because it's it's good. You're going to fail, like you said. You're going to do stuff. It's not going to work, 
right? So reduce the scope of the failure. That's number one. Number two, there's a massive benefit here because every single one of those failures is going to teach you something that's something that you can share. That's something for the content platform. That's something for your next blog post, for your next podcast, for your next presentation, for your book, whatever it is, right? And so, so that is, and, and those stories of I tried, it didn't work, but I learned, those resonate the most, right? Because it humanizes you and people right. want to connect with a human. Right, that's beautiful. Um, so this is such a great interview and we're going to run out of time here, but I, you are one of my coaching clients. So you have a coach. You're one of the most successful people I know. So why does a really successful person have a coach? Um, because I don't know everything. And uh, it's, it's, you know, it's interesting. Like I, I, I wrestled with that question myself, actually, when, when uh, you came recommended to me from, from a mutual uh, a mutual friend, acquaintance, and um, I, I wrestled with that question. And, and the, real, the realization was, again, it kind of comes back to that humility thing, right? It's, it's look, I don't know everything. And I, the, the, the external perspectives that I get today are from within my bubble. So I have a small private community of people like me who do what I do for a living and they give me great advice, but they give it from a very similar perspective to me. And the thing that I found really valuable is to really kind of get that big picture perspective. Um, and, and, and that, that, coaching advice that that simply that coaching from outside of the bubble and and what i found in, in our interactions is the conversations that we've had have challenged what to me was felt like common sense and that is massively valuable to me because if 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 and it's not to say that that, that i want to doubt the common sense but i do want to I, I do want to make sure that i look there's one of me. I'm a, I'm a business of one here. And so how do I prioritize my time is, is the most important thing, decision I make every day. And that external perspective really helps me kind of see that this is something that's worth investing in now rather than later, or this is not worth investing in now rather than later and move on to something else. So I, I greatly value that. Thank you. Um, so you end the book by saying, Reinvent yourself from the person you are today to the person you want to be tomorrow. And to end this conversation, can you say some more about that? And, oh, and before you do that, I want to say that when you, when you get the book, you, there is a workbook that comes for free that you can get online. So I just want to mention that. And uh, we'll, have, we'll have a link below on, on our website. So can you just... Give us a little uh, rah-rah here at the end of reinventing ourselves. Sure. I mean, look, the, the, and again, I'll come back to, to the target reader persona that I described earlier, which again, in my head was, was my best friend. The, the, the person I know that he wants to be tomorrow is comfortable, relaxed, confident, that he can provide for his family, that his career is rewarding and challenging and so forth. And to me, that's, that's the goal, right? And that's where, that's where I'm hoping to get you to with the tactics in the book. And that's where I'm hoping to get um, to, 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 to inspire you to, to give it a shot. Because a lot of folks will read the book and a lot of folks will say, okay, I think I can do this, but very few will actually take those steps forward. And so I would greatly encourage you to do that simply for the prospect of, of, comfort and confidence in, in, the, in the kind of a future reality when it comes to your career. And, and I, think you'll, I think we'll all be happier and f- feel more satisfied with our lives when we make an effort to make, make the most of our potential and who we can be. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Jeff, for spending this time with us today. My pleasure, Sabrina. It was a blast. Thank you. Thank you for joining your host, Sabrina Brahm, on another Women's Leadership Podcast. If you have questions or comments, you can email her at sabrina at sabrinabrahm.com. 
Since 1989, Sabrina and her team have helped hundreds of women managers, business leaders, and entrepreneurs with valuable trainings, articles, books, and executive coaching. For additional tips, interviews, and free access to Great Leaders Today mini-course, visit www.womensleadershipsuccess.com.